Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and we praise you for your word, which is the truth. We receive your word, written in our heart, written in our mind, and we thank you for the revelation of it. We will take hold of it, we'll apply it in our life. It will bring forth much fruit as we do it. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. Tonight we're going to share with you on the subject of how to study God's Word. How to study God's Word so that you can get revelation knowledge and grow up in Him and also be able to get exact, correct, precise knowledge of the Word and be able to see what the Word is saying about every subject. We begin here in Ecclesiastes, class, Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 9. He says, Moreover, because the preacher was wise, he taught the people knowledge. Yea, he gave good heed and sought out and set in order the many proverbs. The preacher sought to find out acceptable words. That which was written was upright, even words of truth. The words of the wise are as goads and as nails fastened by the master's assemblies, which are given from one shepherd. And further by these, my son, be admonished of making many books, there's no end, and much study is the weariness of the flesh. God wants us to study. It is a weariness of the flesh. Now the preacher, anybody who is preaching the gospel, all anybody in the fivefold ministry, needs to be wise. And what is he to do? He's to teach the people knowledge. They need to get the Word of God, not teach them anything contrary to the Word or just not teach them social things, but teach them the Word, the knowledge of the Word. What do we preach? It's the Word of God. And what does he need to do? He needs to give good heed, seek out, set in order the many Proverbs that are in the Scripture on every particular subject. This is why the Word needs to come forth. This is why we do what we do. We preach Scripture after Scripture after Scripture, bringing forth point after point after point on every subject, because that is what is necessary. It's the preacher's responsibility to find out acceptable words. What are the acceptable words? Not whatever they want to say, no. It's the words that were upright that are the words of truth, which is the Word of God. That's what needs to come forth. And so this is what we do. Of course, much study is a weariness of the flesh. But nonetheless, every one of us must study the Word of God and get it in us. It is a lifelong endeavor to get the Word in you. In Isaiah chapter 28 and verse 9, Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? We talked about how important doctrine is. It says, Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. In other words, there's no shortcuts to knowledge. There's no shortcuts to gaining spiritual understanding. No shortcuts to growing up in the way of the Lord. It's going to be scripture by scripture by scripture, point by point, knowledge by knowledge. All these things, it says precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little. This is why we have to get the Word in us. And, of course, what is to be taught? The knowledge of God. Not anything else but teaching the Word of God. And we're going to understand doctrine. Those that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast, we're going to desire the sincere milk of the Word. We're going to grow up and we're going to do the Word and we're going to become strong in the Lord. Over in 2 Timothy, chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's what the King James says. It's actually a mistake in the translation to begin with, because the word study is the word spadazo in the Greek, you see in the lower window, which really means to be diligent, to make haste and exert oneself with diligence. This word Diligence, it's the way Young's literal translates it, which is the correct translation. Other translations have even done this and corrected the King James. It really means to be diligent, to show thyself approved unto God. And if we're going to be diligent to be approved unto God, there's two things we need to do. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, because we're all to do the works of God. Also, we are to rightly divide the word of truth. Well, in order to rightly divide the word of truth, then obviously that means we have to study. We have to have diligent study. 
the translators put that in because they're implying what's necessary for the rightly dividing of the word of truth. But it was a mistake because it takes away from the workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Understanding there's two things we need to be diligent to do to be approved of God. Of course, this points out one thing right off the bat. When you're going to study God's Word, you've got to look up the words. You can't assume that the translations are correct. In this case, we see that it's not correct. It really should be to be diligent to show thyself approved by the two things. A workman that needeth not be ashamed because you do the works of God, and also that you do study, of course, to rightly divide the word of truth. So as we study, we're going to be finding out facts, knowledge of the knowledge of God. We're going to be getting all these truths from the Word of God, revelation knowledge revealed by the Holy Spirit. And we must get precise, accurate revelation, as we've talked about. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 9, here he speaks of the fact that they were to be filled with knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. And the word knowledge is epigenosis, which refers to precise and correct knowledge, exact knowledge of the word. God wants you to get exact knowledge of the word, not what you think it says or not what so-and-so says or just take a scripture or here or there or just follow some tradition that everybody does just because they do it thinking that it's a truth. No, we've got to be able to see it in the Word of God. Now, in order to get revelation knowledge of the Word of God, there are some things that are very important. The first thing is you need to approach every subject that you're studying as if you know nothing. If you approach it as if you know nothing, then you're teachable. Then you are receptive to truth. If you approach it through your preconceived beliefs, teachings, whatever I believe, whatever my church believes, or some doctrinal stand from a denomination or some group or whatever, you're not open to revelation. You're now looking at it through rose-colored glasses, so to speak. If I see everything from a certain perspective, it's always going to have that tint to it. This is why we want to be sure that we approach every subject as if you know nothing. Because if you look at it from a standpoint of what I believe, and you try to fit it into your belief system, you're simply going to be deceived for one, and you're also not open to revelation. It is important that you approach every subject as if you know nothing. Years ago, when I started ministry, and I saw the importance of the fact that everything that I teach, I am responsible for, and I must be sure that what I'm teaching is accurate, because I'm, I'm under the greater judgment because of someone who stands up and teaches the Word. You know, I had the call of God to go forth and do it. At the same time, I had to be sure that it was accurate. And I saw all the different type of teachings and doctrines were out there on many, many different subjects as there are today. And the Lord told me to approach every subject as if you know nothing and start looking at every scripture on a particular subject and study every one of those, knowing that every one of those scriptures are truths about that subject. And don't leave any out understanding that every truth is all a part of the total picture of the revelation of that particular subject. Now, of course, if we're going to bring forth, see revelation knowledge come forth, we have to rely upon the Holy Spirit. And we do have the promise in John chapter 16, in verse 13. Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. The promise is, he will guide you into all truth. The Holy Spirit has promised that he'll do that. Notice it doesn't say just some truth. It says all truth. That means you can understand all truth. Don't think that we can never understand all truth. That's just a religious saying that people have. It's a lie. We can understand all truth. At the same time, we've got to understand the Holy Spirit doesn't originate things. It says, for he shall not speak of himself. The Holy Spirit does not originate things. That's why anything that the Holy Spirit is bringing forth has to be in line with the Word of God because it says, whatsoever he hear, he shall hear, that shall he speak. And what is he hearing? He's hearing the things from above. And he's always going to glorify Jesus. He's going to receive of mine, this is Jesus doing the speaking, and shall show it unto you. This means that everything that the Holy Spirit brings to you will be in line with the Word of God. He doesn't originate things. He simply takes the things he hears from above and is going to bring it unto us. 
So you need to know that the Holy Spirit will guide you <coughs> into all the truth and also know the fact that he is only going to speak things in line with the word. Now another thing we see over in Ephesians chapter 1. <coughs> Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 17. Or we'll begin in verse 16. Paul prayed this prayer for the church at Ephesus, and he said, Cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what's the hope of his calling, what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Here is a good prayer that you can pray by just putting your name in when you're praying or when you're praying for others. You can pray that the Father gives unto you the spirit of wisdom, revelation, and the knowledge of him, that he opens the eyes of your understanding to be enlightened, that you will know what is the hope of his calling and the riches of the glory of his inheritance, the saints. You pray a scriptural prayer for God to bring forth wisdom and revelation and opening the eyes of your understanding. And that is important because you need to look to the Holy Spirit as you pray to the Father, the Holy Spirit, who's the spirit of the Father, will work to bring that revelation to you as you do what the Word says. Another thing that's important, you must know that God's Word is true. In John chapter 17 and verse 17, the Bible says this, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy Word is truth. Another word for what Word refers to, truth means, it also means reality. It refers to that which is reality, spiritual reality. The Word of God is truth and it is reality in the way of the Spirit. So you're going to have to believe the Scriptures are true. Don't sit there and you know, think that, well, some might mean something else. Well, no, they mean what they say. God's Word is the truth, and you need to always look to the Word before you get established in any kind of a doctrinal stand. Don't ever try to follow something that's contrary to the Word of God. You must also know that every Scripture presents a truth. It is presenting a truth about every particular subject. This means we need to look up every word. We need to be sure that every word is meaning what it appears to be, and it's not a mistranslation. And we just can't assume that everything is right. So it's important that we look up every word. We already saw the example where the word translated study means diligent. You'd never get any understanding about being diligent to do these things if you didn't look up the word if you were just using the King James Version. So we need to look up the words, especially the verbs in the Hebrew and the Greek to find out the true meaning. We also must learn to look at the tense, the voice, and the mood for the exact meanings of the verbs. And we'll get to that a little bit later. Another important point is you need to know that all the scriptures fit together, kind of like pieces in a jigsaw puzzle, to present the entire clear picture of any particular subject. You can't just take one scripture and think, oh, I understand this now, when there's other scriptures that may be other pieces of the puzzle that brings forth the, the knowledge of this particular area. So get all the scriptures together. You can't leave them out. And as you see those pieces be of the puzzle, so to speak, with the Word of God, you lay those all out, just like the, the pr preacher's wise, he sets in order the many proverbs and all the many scriptures and brings them forth. Another thing that's helpful as you are studying is to ask questions. Let the Word answer it of who and what and why and when and where and how and these kind of things. Let the Word answer the script, those questions so that it gives you understanding in your life. Now in Proverbs chapter 2 we see a scripture. Proverbs chapter 2 verse, beginning with verse 1. He says, My son, if thou wilt receive my words. That's an important point. In studying the Word of God, you've got to be ready to receive His Word. You can't just ignore this scripture and that scripture, maybe because you don't want to see that scripture or, or whatever. We've got to receive all of His words. So we've got to be receptive to His Word. We don't play pick and choose. We receive every scripture and we know that's a truth. Just because it may not fit in with your doctrines, you don't just ignore that one and, you know, we won't look at that one. We'll find some that seem to fit in with what I believe. You're not going to, you're going to be erring if you do that. So first of all, I have an attitude. You're going to receive the Word of God, and you're going to get this Word in you, and you're going to hide the commandments with you so that you incline ear unto wisdom. You want to hear what God has to say, 
You're going to hear the Word of God with your ears, also with your spiritual ear on the inside, and you're going to apply your heart to understanding. This means you really need to apply your heart. It's going to take some diligent effort on your part to get the revelation knowledge. And you apply your heart to understanding as you seek after it. It says, Yea, if thou criest after knowledge, or calling out for knowledge, praying essentially, and liftest up thy voice for understanding. Again, you're seeking after this, of praying and seeking after this. If thou seekest her as silver, and searchest for her as for hid treasures. I mean, we're not talking about just a casual looking. We're not talking about just read a few scriptures and then just go on from here. No, we're talking about really getting in and seeking and searching and spending time in the Word of God. Like you're searching for something extremely important that you've got to find. That's the attitude we need to have. Then thou shalt understand the fear of the Lord, and you will find the knowledge of God. As you seek, you're going to find. And one of the things that's important is we're going to find the knowledge of God. Now, if you're going to learn how to study effectively, there are some important things you need to realize. First of all, you need to read the Bible and be good to read through the entire Bible for general understanding of what the Bible says. It's good for you to have read through it all. If you haven't, just get on a Bible reading plan. You ought to read through the Bible at least once or more in your life, certainly, and go through it all so that you get the Word in you and be having Bible reading time consistently. Also, it's good that you look at when you're studying a particular area, let's say you're studying a subject, such as you might be studying love or something, and you're looking at scriptures on love. You want to also look at the context that the scripture is in. Don't just take scriptures without looking at the context that they're placed in. Otherwise, you can be making some mistakes because you won't understand the context that it's written in. So you want to get a general knowledge of God's Word, but then as you begin to do specific studies, you want to know the context of where it is. Don't be one of those that lift scriptures out of context. That's how people get in error, and that's how we have such a mess in the body of Christ today. Another thing that's important, and this is the way that I basically teach, which is very important, is doing word studies. Word studies on specific words. And we're not talking about just word studies on like an English word, but what you really want to do is word studies on the particular Greek or Hebrew word in order to see what the Bible is saying. And that is very important. Because if you don't do the word studies, then you're never going to see all the scriptures that pertain to that particular subject. Let's say like over here in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Well, if we just kind of look at that, say desire, we'll say, yeah, I, I desire that. Well, does that just mean kind of, I just desire it because I'd like to have it and be a nice thing? No, you've got to look up these words. And the word here, particularly one for desire, <coughs> is a word which means to actually to long for or to desire, pursue with strong, earnest desire. We're not talking just a casual, oh, I'd like to know that. No, we're talking about a, a strong desire where you're pursuing for something. It's actually the same word translated lust or a forbidden, hidden desire where someone has a real strong, driving desire, a craving for something. They want this. That's the attitude it's talking about in this particular word. So it's not talking about just a, just a simple attitude of mind desire. We're talking about it's an active word where you are going to desire strong, you're going to desire the sincere milk of the word. And this is imperative meaning it's a command that God wants for you to desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Now, as we get into word studies, that is where, the, where, where you're going to be able to really get revelation on every particular subject. But you're going to have to look up these Greek words, which we'll cover in a little bit, and as you look up the Greek words on a particular subject, you're going to be able to study effectively. For instance, this word desire, and I'm going to do some different things on here using this program. If I click on this word desire, and I can bring all these in this particular program, we see all these ones, the yellow desire. Now this particular one, if you noticed, <coughs> uh, when we saw this one over here, it happened to be the number 1971. If you look in the lower right, lower left, I mean, the lower 1971. I'll just get this out of the way. 1971, epipotheo. Well, 
if we come over here to the New Testament, and this is listing all the words for desire. Just because you see desire doesn't mean that it means that it's always the same thing. And this will show it here. If I click on this particular word for desire, put the cursor over it, it's a different word. Notice it's number 2309 below. See the numbers down below? Thelo, which means will. That's a different word than the other one. If I have one over here, here's one that's number 154, which is Iteo, which means a, a demand of what's due you when we studied that. We've talked about that. So here, we just looked at three different scriptures that use desire, and we got three different Greek words. So obviously, you know, hey, they're all different. We're talking about something different. That's just an example of where what you do is you want to look up all these words, not just the English word, but you want to check them out with the Greek word or the Hebrew word so you can be sure that what you're really talking about. And that is very important. We'll be discussing that a little bit more as we go. As we get the knowledge of God, we must receive the knowledge of God and we must apply it and do it in our life. We can't just reject the knowledge of God and do what we want. In Hosea chapter 4, in verse 6, the Bible says this, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. We need knowledge. But why? What happened in this case? It wasn't like the th fact that they didn't have the opportunity to get knowledge. Notice what it says. Because thou hast rejected knowledge. Here, why did they have a lack of knowledge? Because they rejected it. If you reject the knowledge of God, it will be the word will be taken out of your heart. You won't have the knowledge of God, and you won't see the fruit of it. And, of course, what else did he say? I will reject thee. I find that so many times Christians today with particular doctrines that are contrary to the Word, they have certain scriptures on them, but then they ignore other scriptures. And when you bring those scriptures up to them, they, they, they will don't want to listen to those scriptures. They want to jump to another scripture, uh, one, one of their favorite ones to tout their doctrine, and they just kind of try to pass you off on the scriptures that you brought up that are showing that their doctrine is false. That shows these people are rejecting knowledge. They just want to jump to something else that their favorite scripture is to tout their so-called doctrinal stand that they believe is right. That's, don't reject knowledge. If the word is presented to you, that's a truth. You need to take a look at it and incorporate that into the study about what you're looking at in order to find the truth. And what happens? You reject knowledge, God's going to reject you, as he says, and you're going to end up being destroyed for lack of knowledge. We also see another scripture in Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 13 and he says this Isaiah 5 13 therefore my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge that means that without the knowledge of God you're going to be in captivity of the enemy the enemy is going to be able to come in take advantage of the fact that you're ignorant you don't know what the situation is and he'll be able to deceive you and lead you in a destructive path that's why we've got to get the knowledge of God and get the exact knowledge and God wants us to grow in the knowledge of God <coughs> in 2nd Peter in chapter 3 here in verse 18 grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ God wants you to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord so we need to get the knowledge of God and that is of paramount importance when you're studying, you're seeking after revelation knowledge. And we mentioned that you are to seek after this diligently. Seek and search it out. That's got to be your attitude. Ecclesiastes 1, verse 13. He says, I gave my heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all things that are done under, under, under heaven. He gave his heart to seek this out. That shows the fact that it's got to be real uh, a desire from within. You know, you, your heart is in there to really seek this out and study this out to know the truth. So you're going to put your all into it. We see another scripture in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 25, where it says, I applied my, applied my heart to know and to search and to seek out wisdom and the reason of things, to know the wickedness of folly, even a foolish is madness. He wanted to know all these things. He's going to apply his heart to seek and search it out and find out these things to get the knowledge of God. That's the attitude you have to have. With that kind of an attitude, you're going to put your whole being in it. You know, you aren't going to do things half-heartedly. You're going to do it with all of your heart. In Proverbs chapter 25, verse 2, 
It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. God conceals the things of the Word of God from those who are not right with Him. He has to be revealed by the Holy Spirit. He spoke many things in parables so they wouldn't understand. But those who it is given to know, who are the ones who come in a relationship with Him and seek, are the ones that it's revealed to. And so it's the honor of kings to search out a matter. Well, you and I are kings. Jesus is the King of kings. You and I are to search out the matter. It's an honor for us to search out the things that He has set forth in His Word. We know that you and I, as it says in Matthew chapter 6, He tells us things we're to seek. And so you seek. You're to be seeking diligently. Matthew 6, 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. You need to seek the kingdom, which is the rule and the reign of God, and you need to seek His righteousness. Because you're going to come to the place of ruling and reigning over your enemies, and you're also going to come to the place of walking in His right ways so that you're always right with the Lord. Which means you're going to have to search the Scriptures. Jesus even said in John chapter 5, down here in verse 39, He said this, Search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Searching the Scriptures. In fact, everything that you hear from any kind of message from anybody, doesn't matter who it is, doesn't matter if you think he's the most well-known preacher and he's got to be teaching me the truth, well, you better check the Scriptures out, because he may not be teaching you the truth. Just because he's well-known or has some kind of notoriety, that means nothing. Check out the Scriptures. Acts 17, 11 says, speaking of those from Berea, these are the ones that came when they came from Berea, that they were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the Scriptures daily whether those things were so. Now this also tells you something. As the word's coming, you need to have a reception to it. This is the word decamai, not the word lambano. This means a ready reception of what's offered to you. Be ready to receive what's coming to you. And you do it with all readiness of mind. Your mind is ready to seek out and to receive the Word of God and at the same time search the Scriptures daily whether the things were so. Just don't believe something because so-and-so says it, you know, or because everybody has believed it or because it's such a doctrine of such and such a church organization or group or whatever, or I've been raised in that and everybody's believed that. No, you've got to search the Scriptures because if you cannot find it in the Word of God, it's not of the Lord. It doesn't matter what, the, what, the great, what everybody out there says. I don't care whether 99% of all the people are believing it, but if it's not in the Scriptures, it's not of the Lord. You've got to always check things out and find that they're in the Word of God. Now, another thing is, as you are seeking, we're not talking about just, again, seeking casually, we're talking about you really spending the time to look into things. In James chapter 1, verse 25, it says, Whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. This word looketh is a particular word which means to stoop to a thing in order to look at, and where they looked in and carefully inspected it. It has the aspect of carefully inspecting something and looking to see this, a real, not just a casual glance, but I mean you get down there and you really look at this and you carefully inspect this because you want to see every facet, every aspect of it. This is the same word that's used when it talks about those who came to look for Jesus in the tomb. It's the same Greek word used over in uh, Luke 24, uh, 12, it talks about just one example. <clears throat> show you where Peter and ran the sepulchre and stooping down paracupto he beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves departed wondering himself to that which was come to pass here he was stooping down to inspect carefully and looking at this you have to believe that he just didn't glance in there and say well I don't see Jesus there we'll just go on our way oh no he must have checked that thing out and says you know where is he you know, want to be sure he's not here, and they, they checked everything out. So it's looking carefully into or inspecting thoroughly. That's what this particular word means. That's what we're supposed to do. God wants you to get into the Word. He wants you to have a great desire to study the Word of God. 
If you don't have a great desire to study the Word of God, then there's something that is not right going on in your mind. It's the enemy working against you. You should have an insatiable desire to study the Word because your spirit already wants to study the Word. Your spirit wants to get into the Word of God. So you're going to look into the perfect law of liberty, but you're also going to continue in it. You're going to start doing this Word and applying it in your life. You are to continue in the Word, not just hear it and then just go off. You need to hear it and do it incorporate it into your lifestyle, start putting it into operation. So you're not a forgetful hearer, but you're a doer of this work. You're working the Word in your life, and you're going to be blessed in your deeds. This is so important. The best way, really, to get the truth on any particular subject is to do in-depth word studies about a particular subject. It takes a tremendous amount of time. And, but at the same time, it's the only way you're going to be able to study things and look it, out, look it up. Let's say you're looking at about law in the New Testament, it's the word nomos. Well, you've got to look up every single place where it talks about nomos. If you don't look up every single place, you're not going to see all the aspects of it. Or maybe you're looking about being a doer. You know, what the doer? You're going to look up every single word that uses poetis. You're going to find out every aspect of it. You're going to study everything, or continue with here is a parameno, it comes from the root meno, and you're going to look up every single word on that so you can see all the aspects of what it means. It is going to take time in order to do this. Now, helpful materials that will help you, and I brought just some materials along just to show you. These are books, but mainly I use my computer now. But if you don't have a computer, then these books can be helpful, but I highly recommend you get a computer. But still, the books, are still I use these as well, because there's many helpful things in them. First of all, you need a Bible that uh, would be Textus Receptus based. And if you have a Bible such as uh, that's a re reference Bible, center column reference, or like a, uh, a K Thompson chain reference Bible, has a lot of scriptural reference to be able to see where things come from, that's a good thing. This is one, it's by Crusade, it's a new uh, an analytical study Bible that has all kind of center, center column references in it where it's got scriptures all on the side. Some of them are center, these are on the side so I can see where things are coming from. If they're maybe coming from the Old Testament or whatever. But you need to get some sort of a Bible that you can really study in and look in and you want it to be Textus Receptus based, which would be the King James Version. It would be the New King James Version or it would be like Young's Literal Translation or there's also some others, one's called the Literal Translation of the Bible by J.P. Green. It's not real well known. There's also one called the Modern King James Version, which is made off of the, uh, a, a particular Greek text by Robinson and Pierpont that has come forth. It's like the Texas Receptus, but even a little bit more refined because they used all the Greek manuscripts that are available and corrected a few things in the King James. It's about 99% the same as the Texas Receptus. Now the King James has a lot of problems, as we have shown you and you'll see tonight. This is why, the, why do I use the King James? Because in this particular program, it shows the Strong's numbers in the lower window, like I put the cursor over this, see in the lower window number 3879 in the Greek word, keyed into strong so that I can show you what the particular words mean. Now the one that I use the most, especially for the New Testament, is Young's Literal Translation. This is Young's Literal Translation. You hear me talk about it all the time. And it's one that uh, we can get for you if anybody wants it. We've already purchased them before and people have already bought them out, but if you need to get any more. Robert Young, <clears throat> his first translation was in 1862, and he has been very true especially in the New Testament, especially to the tense, the voice, and the mood of the, of the verbs, as well as uh, translating things accurately. You're going to see some examples of it tonight. But this is a hardback one that's available. It can be gotten actually through Amazon.com <coughs> yourself if you want to get it. Now, if you do use other translations which are not based on the Textus Receptus, these would be the Revised Version, American Standard Version, Revised Standard Version, New American Standard Version, New International Version, New Revised Standard Version, New Living Translation, Message Bible, any of these paraphrase type ones, Living Bible, English Standard Version, which is a new one that's come out around 2001, the Amplified Version, all of these versions 
are not based on the Textus Receptus. They're instead based on a text that has been uh, from Westcott and Hort that was the basis of the revised version in 1881, which was a new translation based on a different Greek text. We've talked about this in our series on how we got the Bible and comparing Bible versions. You're going to see some things tonight. If you use one of these other translations, you want to be sure you compare it to a Textus Receptus type of a translation. Uh, and one of the things that I do have and I do use from time to time is what's called, this is one's called the Comparative Study Bible, if you have for that. And this one has the King James, the Amplified, the New American Standard, and the New International Version in it. So I can sit there and see what these are. The Amplified's very popular, New American Standard's popular, NIV's popular. You know, a lot of people use these ones. Now, one thing, the New American Standard is probably the best of all of those translations that are, that are uh, the, ba not based on the New Textus Receptus. The, the New American Standard has, correct, has corrected a lot of King James errors and it has a lot of things that are good. The only problem is that it has not of course, followed the Textus Receptus. And I wanted to show you, and we've talked about this, but let's show you one example. In fact, first of all, <clears throat> let me show you in the King James Revelation 22. This is just one example. And we gave you, what, 150, 200 scriptures or so going through the Bible showing you the changes that have been made from the Greek text. In Revelation 22, 14, notice what it says. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life. That's what the King James says. Young's literal translations, happy are those that are, that are, are those doing his commands. Now, why is Young's good? Here's a good example of showing why Young's is so good. I put the cursor over the word do. I can bring up the tense, the voice, and the mood of the verbs. There is tense, there is voice, and there's mood, and I'll talk about this in a little bit, but the tense here is the present tense, and just to tell you about the tense, the present tense means continuous, repeated action. So, this is why it would say, blessed are they that are doing. If it's continuous, repeated action, then I'm doing it and continuing to do it. That's why Young's translates it, happy are those doing. It shows the continuous action of it. That's why he's translated so good. Happy are those doing his commands. But we can see that each one is talking about doing his commands. The word do, by the way, is poeo, which means it's translated make or do. <clears throat> when we look at it, the way it's translated, do 357 times, make 113 times, out of these, most of the times of the 579 that they're used. All right? And also commands. This is the word for command that is used as well. And we see that of the 71 times, 69 times, is translated command, two times precept. The reason I'm showing this is so you see this particular word means do and it means command. Now, here's the parallel of this verse. Revelation 22, verse 14, in other versions. The one on the left, the ESV, is the English Standard Version. The next one is the New American Standard Version. The next one is the NIV, the New International Version. The next one is the New King James Version that I put up so you'll see it's similar to the King James in its okay translation. And the last one is the New Living Translation. These are some of the ones that I put up here. <coughs> now, the New King James that follows it, notice what it says over here. Blessed are those who do His commandments. Very similar to the King James, exactly. But let's look at these other ones. Here's the English Standard. Blessed are those who wash their robes, wash their robes, so that they may have the right to the tree of life. Since when does washing our robes give us the right to the tree of life? It doesn't. It's doing His commandments. But if you use an English Standard Version, that's what you're going to read there. New American Standard, wash their robes. NIV, wash their robes. New Living Translation, wash their robes. we got a problem here. There's not in line with the Word of God. Washing your, people that read this out of these translations will think, all i got to do is wash my robes and praise God, I'll have the right to the tree of life. Sorry, you're, you do that, you're not going to get there. It's those who d are doing His commands. And I'll just show you one other one. <clears throat> 
in Revelation. We've shown this to you before, but if you haven't seen it, Revelation 8.13 says, I beheld and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, whoa, whoa, whoa. What does Young say? He actually translates it a messenger, which is referring to angels are the ones who do this. It's also a messenger flying in the mid-heaven, saying with a great voice. And uh, what does this mean? First of all, the word angel is angelos, and we'll see that the usage of it, which we can look at here, <clears throat> 186 times this is used, 179 times is translated angel, seven times translated messenger. He chose to translate it messenger. But it's always it refers to as an angel, and this is talking about an angel. Throughout Revelation, we see it was the angels who were doing things. Well, if we go over here now, and we look at these others, and let's jump over here, and we'll see this in chapter 8 of Revelation. In fact, we're going to go to chapter 9 and go backwards. It's going to be easier to so there. This is chapter 8, verse 13 in the other translations. First of all, in the New King James, it says, And I looked, and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven. That's what, what about the English Standard Version? Then I looked, and I heard an eagle cry in a loud voice. Eagles don't talk. Angels do. But you read it in that translation, you're not going to know it's an angel. New American Standard, eagle. NIV, eagle. New Living Translation, eagle. This is why we do not recommend using these translations. You can clearly see that there is a problem. The problem is the fact that these translations are, have been changed in the Greek text, and therefore they're not reliant. If you do use one of these translations, compare it to a King James or a New King James or a Young's Literal Translation. That's, otherwise, you could be deceived and you could miss the point. And if you didn't hear our series on comparing Bible versions, we've got that on DVD or CD, and we recommend that you get that if you'd like to hear that. Now, another thing that's important that we use is a concordance. And I have my Strong's Concordance here. Strong's Concordance is a listing by every word of all the scriptures on a particular subject. Let's say, here's the word presence, when I just opened up. And presence shows from Genesis all the way through Revelation. It shows the scriptures from in an in a, uh, order from Genesis to Revelation. It shows a portion of the scriptures and the address, the scripture address. Like here, the first use of that was in Genesis 3.8. And the last use of that was in Revelation chapter 10, chapter 14, verse 10. Now, what also is in the, King, in the Strong's Concordance is next to it, there is a number all along next to each one of those verses. The number is just in normal type for all the Old Testament ones. When you get to New Testament ones, it'll be italicized, and you can come up and see this later if you like, but these numbers correspond to the dictionaries in the back. And in the back, they have a Hebrew dictionary, which is here in the back part, the Hebrew dictionaries in the back, and it will show you all the particular Hebrew words throughout. And they're listed here by number, because you see in what I'm talking about, here they are. You can't see it too well, but you'll see it later, that it's by number. We see that these particular listed, and it gives the mean, uh, meaning of the words. It also shows what these words are translated in the King James Version. And then here's the Greek. The Greek is behind that, the Hebrew and the Greek. And this can be very helpful because you're going to be able to look at a listing of the words. Like, remember, we looked at desire, and we saw three different Greek words. Well, you'd be able to look up each one of those Greek words in the back and find out what it means. You just look at it in your King James, you won't know. But you take that word desire, you look, find desire. I see these three different words in the Greek. I go back to the Greek dictionary. I look up the number. I can see which one's used, and I can find out what the real, true meaning of it. So the Strong's Concordance is very helpful for you to be able to study accurately, and everybody needs a Strong's Concordance or else to be able to have a computer whereby you can use that. <clears throat> now, one other thing, let me tell you about the Strong's Concordance, and I've seen ministers, pastors, all kinds of people misuse this and make great mistakes, even Bible school uh, groups and even uh, <clears throat> Bible works made the mistake as well 
on this, of giving definitions that from Strong's that are not accurate. And in fact, if I show you the one over in uh, John chapter 16 talking about Aitea, I pointed this out before, but when you look at the particular word ask, I put the cursor over the word ask and notice it's 154 Aitea. And what's their meaning? It says ask, beg, call for, crave, desire, require. Is that the meaning? No. That is not the meaning of the word. That's what the word has been translated as in the English King James Version. In other words, Iteo has been translated ask, Iteo has been translated beg, Iteo has been translated call for, crave, desire, require. That's what it was translated as, not the meaning of it. Now, it's important when you read in the Strong's, in the Strong's it will have italicized information which will be the meaning of the word. But then, for each number, and then you'll come to a colon and a dash. If you know, how many of you have a Strong's concordance? You know what I'm talking about. You'll come to a colon and a dash. After the colon and the dash, that's not meanings of the words from then on. Those are all of the English words that the Greek word or the Hebrew word is translated as in the King James Version, like what we see here. You would find a colon and a dash, and you'll see the listing of ask, beg, call for, crave, desire, require. Notice there, you'll notice that they're always in alphabetical order. You want to be sure you use the strong concordance accurately because they made a mistake here. In fact, we can even show you as I bring up the Lightning Bible, this particular one brings up the Strong's, exactly what's in Strong's concordance. <clears throat> and here, when I bring this up, this is what you see in Strong's concordance uncertain derivation to ask, it's in a general sense, and then it shows you what it's been translated as, ask, beg, call for, crave, desire, require. So why did the Bible works people put this in as the meaning, ask, beg, call for, crave, desire, require? These are the guys that are supposed to be the, pr the pros, and yet they missed it themselves. That is not the meaning of the words. That is what it's been translated as. What is the meaning? of the word. How are you going to find out? Well, that's where we can look in Strong's, and we can go to the comparison, which we've shown you before, but just to show you again, for those who haven't seen it, this is the comparison here of similar type of Greek words. And number 154 means a demand of something due. It's a general, that's the specific word. It means a demand of something due. And so here's where you can discover what the word really means. So it's important that we look words up, and this is the Strong's showing exactly what it means. Now, another thing that's important that can be helpful is you can use other lexicons or information that's good. One of them is Vine's Expository Dictionary of New Testament Words. It is very good. It gives a lot of information more extensive than what the, uh, uh, the strong, Strong's does. Here's an example. When I look up the word for receive in here, and I find that all the different words that are translated receive. And remember that we have talked to you about lambano and about decamai. Well, here's decamai and lambano are in here. And it gives a, much information about it. And it even gives this one where they give a comparison saying that lambano suggests a self-prompted taking, taking hold of, whereas decamai more frequently indicates a welcoming or an appropriating reception, which is a ready reception where it's offered to you a passive reception as opposed to an active reception. He's got that kind of information in here. So Vine's Expository Dictionary is a pretty good, uh, another thing that can help you. There's also other type of lexicons that you can get, and there's all kinds of resources even on this one. There are ones that are from Thayer's, there's ones from Freiburg, there's ones that are from uh, the low, uh, Nita lexicon and different ones that I use, and this is not to confuse you, but to show you that I can look up all these in various other lexicons. There's also the Brown Briggs uh, Driver, Driver Briggs uh, Hebrew one, <clears throat> all different kinds of ones, and I've got all those things at home so I can check all those out. But not to get you overwhelmed by this, but to show you that there's a lot of resources that you can use and find out what meanings are. 
Another thing that can be helpful for you is say, well, I don't know Greek, but I sure would like to kind of see where, how they translated things. Well, they do have what's called interlinear Greek English New Testaments, or also in Hebrew English Old Testaments. And this is one by Barry that was keyed to the King James Version, in which it has the King James Version along the side, and then it has the, King, it has the Greek with the English translation of the word under it. And so this can be helpful as well. And this was Barry's translation of it, but it shows well, the Greek word and how it was translated underneath it. So it can help you as well. And I use that from time to time, but most of the time I use the computer. One other thing, if you happen to know Greek and you don't have a computer, you can use what's called an analytical Greek lexicon. What this is, is got all the Greek words in the entire New Testament in the Bible are all here and it gives all the parts of speech, every part of speech of every single one. But you have to know Greek because you look it up by the Greek alphabet. I will say one thing. When I was in college, before I got born again, I did join a fraternity. There's only one good thing about joining a fraternity. Everything else was bad, I guarantee you. One good thing, they made you memorize the Greek alphabet. I praise God that they made me memorize it because then when I came to the Greek, I already knew it, and I remembered it. We had to memorize it and be able to speak it, and, and it had to do that. And I remembered all those letters. So that was helpful, the fact that, you know, you learned the Greek. It's not that great uh, endeavor to learn the Greek alphabet, but that can help you immensely to be able to look things up, because, but when you know the alphabet and the order of it. These are just some things that can be helpful for you. But the best thing that can help you to be able to study is to have a computer and to be able to get the programs. The program that you see me use is called the Bible Works program. It is probably, in my opinion, the best program in the world today that I'm aware of, where it can do tremendous things. It can do word studies on anything. It can do studies on just the words, but I can also do studies on the particular numbers. Uh, and just not to confuse you, but let me I put this on, you'll see what happens. I can, this is what's on my computer all the time. These are all the Greek words for every single one of these words. So if I'm looking here and I want to do a study on number 154, I can double click on this and it will bring up, and I'll just even show you just briefly, because I've got multiple windows in this thing. It is a tremendous program. And I can uh, take this <coughs> number 154 double click on it and it just brought up every single word every scripture where 154 is used in the entire New Testament and it's all every address of it is all right here and I can sit here and just bring up every single one just click on them and they come up right before me and I can see every single one of them also I can copy every one of these down into the word processor and I can print them out and I can do word studies in five minutes I can just I want to know everything about Iteo I just bring it up, I just copy this entire string into here, and I go over and I print it, and the whole thing can be printed. Uh, it takes longer to have it printed out through the printer than it does for me to do it. It's that quick when you have this type of a particular program. This is a tremendous program. It is $349, and I'm not pushing this program, you, you, have, you know, but it's the best program out there. I don't know of anything that that's matches it. Uh, <clears throat> there's a different interface on the newer ones. Um, they changed the interface with BibleWorks 7. This is 6. Uh, 7 and 8, 8 is also, it has more information on it. It's very good. But 6 is the best from a standpoint of presentation. And I also use it because I like to have this over here where I essentially have my little concordance in here. I got a concordance of every single word. I just clicked on me. There's 4,096 uses of me and I've got the entire uh, every word in the entire New Testament that's right here. Also, you can search by numbers. Here's all the numbers. Every single number, Strong's number, is also inside here. I can click on these and do a search on every, anything so I have an absolute search of every single thing. I can also search vo tenses, voice, mood. I can put any kind of combination together I want. I can do parallel of all kinds. Can you can do anything on this program. Let me tell you, it's if you want to spend any money to be able to do study, this is the best. It is $349. It's pricey. But in my opinion, it's, it's worth $10,000 to me from what I've used, and I've used this for the last many, many years. 
Now, there is one that is a free program that I would tell you to help you to learn to study. It's called eSword. eSword can be a guy, if you have a computer, you can get this and download this into your computer for free. It costs you nothing. It's nothing compared to the one that I have, the Bible works. But nonetheless, you can do tremendous studies on it. In the eSword, you can get all kinds of translations. There's all these different translations that I put into mine. Greek translations, Hebrew translations, Young's Literals up here. All kinds of translations you can get. You can put them up in parallel as well. And you can put up different ones that you want to take a look at and look these. So there's lots of different things that you can do. Um, what I do here is also you can have this particular one has all the Strong's numbers. That's what these numbers are. And it also the ones in blue are all of showing what part of speech it is. And when you put in particular, uh, they call the Robinson Pierpoint Morphological Analysis Codes, you can put in here and you can see all the verbs in this thing. And when I uh, put it in here, I can bring all the parts of speech up on anything. Every part of speech. Here's like this verb. I just double click on this thing. And it brought up down below here the verb information about it. It's a future passive indicative mood. So this is something where you can do a lot of the study on here. And I'd be glad to help you on this uh, if you'd like to have information about it. The address to get this is e-sword.net. If anybody wants to get that, I'll give that to you later. I just put it on here if it's on the computer or it's on the tape here. e-sword.net. That's where you would get that from. So that could be a great help for you to be able to study. By using these, you can do all kinds of word studies and do a tremendous uh, job of being able to do things very, very quickly. Now, there are major problems in all these different translations. And if we're going to study, we want to do word studies. And let me show you the importance of doing word studies. Let's just take a scripture where you need to look up the words, the importance of it. Word studies is the best way that you can do anything because then you'll see all the aspects of what a particular word means. Let's, for example, here's where we got to look up the words. Luke 10, 19. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpent scorpions over all the power of the enemy. If you're reading this in the King James, you see power and power. So it means God's given me power against the power of the enemy. Is that what it really means? No. How do you know? Because I put the cursor over the first word power, and it is the word exousia, which means authority. It has been translated authority 29 times in the King James, which is correct. Unfortunately, they translated it 69 times power, which was a mistake. Young's literal corrects it. It's authority. That's what it means. The word for power, the second word power, is a different word. Look at the number below. It's 1411. That's a different number. And this word is dunamis. And this truly does mean power and has been translated power the majority of the time, although they translated it some different things from time to time which weren't accurate. See, when you see that they're not translated consistently, you know there must be a problem. There's been an inconsistency of translation in the King James, and it's also true in other versions as well. This is the thing that I like about Young so much. One thing that Young's did, he sought to translate the words consistently the same thing, if possible, in all the cases, so that there wasn't any, you know, power here, power there. Is it talking about the same Greek word or what? You know, which one is it? You know, when it was 1849, which is authority, he was translating authority throughout. And if it's 1411, it's power, he's translating it power throughout. So that then you're going to see the word really means what it means. So this shows an example of where there's the same English word translated, like in the King James, for two or more different Greek words. So we have a problem. There are inconsistent translations, for sure. There's errors in the translations. And we'll just show you some here. Hebrews, chapter 10. Here's just a prime example. Verse 23, where it says, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith. I put the cursor over the word faith. It's the word El Peace, number 1680. It means hope. That's what it means to have hope, which you can see in the usage. 54 times this word is used. 53 times it's translated hope. 
One time it's translated faith erroneously. This is the place where it's done. Why? Who knows why? But it's totally wrong. It, instead, it says, let us hold fast the profession of our hope. The confession of your hope is the release of faith, not the confession of our faith. And so just a small little area, but everything is important to be able to be sure that we have things accurately. Here's another example in Hebrews chapter 6, over here in verse 12. That you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. When I put the cursor over the word patience, it's a word macrothumia, number 3115. I come down here and I find out that there's 14 uses of it. Twelve of them are translated long-suffering. Two of them are translated patience. The word really means long-suffering is what it should be translated. Unfortunately, they translated it in error. Therefore, you won't know that it means long-suffering, which is a fruit of the Spirit. Instead, you'll think it's patience, which is of the soul. And you won't understand what's really being said unless you look it up. We've got to look these things up to be sure. Now, here's another one that could be helpful for you. It is a word in the Old Testament for intercession. When people talk about intercession, and this is why I wrote the book that I wrote on intercession, really covers this in, in depth, where he was looking for an intercessor in Isaiah 59, 16. You put the cursor over the word intercessor, it's this Hebrew word pagah, number 6293. And notice they say, encounter, meet, reach, and treat, make intercession. This is not the meaning of the thing. This is what the, it's translated as in the King James. It's translated, meet, reach, and treat, intercession, and all these different things. Again, they did not do a good job here. How are we going to find out what it means? Notice the number, 6293. And I can go over here in my, this is Lightning Bible, which is another good program that helps to bring up the exact meaning in the Strong's, because this is Strong's concordance inside of this thing. I plugged in my number 6293, Pagah, and here's the meaning of it. It means to impinge, impinge by accident or violence, by importunity. You may not know what the word impinge means. By the way, a dictionary is a good thing to use once you find the exact meaning of the word in the Hebrew or the Greek. Don't use the dictionary just looking at the English word. You could be out in left field. But when you find out the exact word, then you can use your dictionary to look it up. What does impinge mean? You look up impinge and it means to strike at or drive at something. Now you'd never get that in a million years just looking at intercessor. Strike at or drive at? I thought he'd just pray and just to see whatever God would do. But the intercessor is involved in warfare striking at and driving at the enemy in the spirit is what it's a revelation of the intercession principles and he's doing it with violence not by accident with violence against the enemy with importunity which means persistence persistence attack against the enemy because that's what you're doing in intercession you'd never get this just by looking at this in a normal type of a version this is why it's important to look at things there also are some major errors that you just need to be aware of. And you cannot trust any of the translations. Psalms chapter 8, verse 5 is a good example. It's talking about man here. What's man? He's my, what's, thou art mindful of him, the son of man that thou visited him. For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Was man made lower than the angels? No. The angels are lower than man. What was man made a little lower than? God. Because it's the fact that he was made in the image of God, right? Well, let's put the cursor over the word angels and find out whether or not that's, which is the truth. It happens to be the word Elohim. And let's look at the usage of Elohim. Elohim, 2,606 times it's in there, 2,346 times is translated God, 244 times God, one time is it translated angels. Here, it's a mistake in the translation. Apparently, they didn't have the guts to say the fact that God, that we're made a little lower than God. And it was a lie. It's not the truth. He has made him a little lower than, the, than God. In fact, I like what Young's brings out. He brings out the fact Elohim, which is the plurality of word for God, referring to the plurality of the Godhead. He translates it Godhead 
which is really what we're talking about. Made him a little lower than the Godhead, which is talking about the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So this is where you've got to look up these kind of things. Otherwise, you're going to see that you could be reading something and it can be totally false. Matthew chapter 16. This is what I've learned to do. This is how I've arrived at the truth on all these things, by looking them up. And without looking them up, I can never trust just what I'm reading in a translation. Matthew 16, 19, here's another example. I'll give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. The word, it looks like it's talking about the kingdom of heaven where God is. But it's not talking about that. It looks like if I bind on earth, it'll be bound in heaven, meaning heaven's going to do something with it. It doesn't mean that at all. How do we know? Because the word heaven is plural in the Greek. Young's literal has corrected the error. Heavens. Heavens. And heavens. Right here. And I can prove this to you, showing you. Now, the King James didn't do it. None of the modern versions have done it, even the ones Texas Receptus based. But this is Scrivener's translation, which is on here as well, which is the translation that is from the Texas Receptus of the King James in the Greek. When I put the cursor over this particular word, this is the word, I'll try to bring this up, get the, I'll bring it up. When we put this over it, you can see that it is a noun, genitive, masculine, plural in the lower window, and it's translated heaven. But notice, it's plural. If you see that, it is plural. So we can check this out. Here's the next one, right there. It's a dative masculine, plural, for heavens. And here happens to be, that's well, down here farther. The bottom down here is the last one, and we can bring that up. And I had the cursor over that. It's again, dative, masculine, plural. So we can see and prove this, that it's supposed to be heavens. I mean, it changes the entire meaning. I've given you the keys of the kingdom of the heavens. Well, what's up in the heavens? The principalities, the powers, the rulers of the darkness, spiritual wickedness, all the evil spirits that are operating. The rule and the reign of the heavens. Whatsoever you bound on earth shall be, literally, having been bound in the heavens. The reason why, the other thing, you can't just, you read this, you might think shall be bound. This sounds like it's all one verb, doesn't it? But watch what happens when I put the cursor over the word be. Notice a word comes up, 2071, in the lower window. When I move it over bound, a whole different word comes up, 1210, deo. That tells you there's two different verbs there. The first one is a normal type of a verb where it happens to be, as it shows, future indicative verb, shall be. Bound is actually a participle. Whoops, there it is. Perfect passive participle. So what it literally, a participle is tra not translated as a normal verb. It's translated as having been something. That's why Young's literal translates this. Whatsoever thou mayest bound, bind upon the earth shall be having been bound. That is a correct Greek translation. That changes the whole thing. Otherwise, it shall be having been bound in the heavens. Who's in control of uh, getting bound? You and I are on earth, because we're the ones on earth. Whatsoever you bind on earth, because you have the authority, shall be, it'll be accomplished, having been bound in the heavens because of what you did on earth. And where does it take effect? In the heavens. It's not talking about heaven where God is. Let me even show you one other scripture that will show you that even this is very similar to this. Look at Matthew 11, 12. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. Now, if this means the kingdom of heaven, that's where God is, right? Is the kingdom of heaven suffering violence? Is somebody attacking heaven? Are the violent ones taking it, the kingdom of heaven, by force? They're taking God's uh, place away, you know, his place where he re it reigns away? No. You know that can't be true, so there must be something wrong here. Well, the word heaven, it's plural again. It says the kingdom of the heavens is suffering violence. Well, what's the kingdom? The rule and the reign of the heavens. Who's up there in the heavens that's causing the problems? The principalities, the powers, the rulers of the darkness, the spiritual wickedness in the heavenly places. So it's talking about the evil spirits that are going to suffer violence in the heavens. And the violent are taking it by force. Who are the violent ones? 
the church, believers, who are attacking the spirits in the heavens to cast them down, bind them, loose them, cast them down, throw them down. See, without looking at this, you'd never have any earthly idea that it's talking about that if you just read it with kingdom of heaven, singular. But instead, it's talking about the kingdom of the heavens. So we see that there are major problems in the translations. We've got to look up all these things. And you can't just assume that every word means what it apparently looks like it means. Here's another example. We've looked at this several times when we talked about prayer, but this is important for you to realize. John 16, 23, In that day you shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he'll give it you. Who's doing the speaking? Jesus is. What does he say? In that day, which is talking about the day after the resurrection, you don't ask him anything. Therefore, everybody who's praying to Jesus, asking things of Jesus, is a direct violation of what Jesus said not to do. They're violating this. He said, don't ask me anything. You're not going to ask me anything. Why? Because that's not who you approach. Who do we pray to? The Father, not Jesus. Who do we pray? Well, how do we pray to the Father? In the name of Jesus, because he's in a high priestly ministry. As a priest going through the high priest to the Father. You pray directly to the Father. That means all these people that are praying to Jesus or praying to whatever else, but they're not praying to the Father, are praying in error. And you look throughout the New Testament, and I've got all the scriptures on it. You look at all the prayer scriptures throughout the New Testament, it's always praying to the Father. Always praying to the Father. Or whenever it talks about praying to God, God is always called God the Father in the New Testament. Always. God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And there are scriptures after scriptures of it continually. Now, another thing. The first word, ask, let's bring this up, is this word, aratio, which means to question, ask, or request. Number 2065. The second word, ask, is 154, aiteo. There is a difference here, obviously. You're not going to request of me nothing now. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever you shall ask, remember when we looked at 154 and we saw it was a demand of something due? That's what this is talking about. Whatsoever you shall make a demand of what's due the Father in my name, he will give it you. It shows the change in New Testament prayer. We don't pray now to Jesus. We pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. We don't request, ask, and petition. Instead, we make a demand of what's due us by bringing the Scripture promise to him to take hold of it so it will come into manifestation in our life. And this is important. We've taught on the area of prayer. If you never read our book, Accurate New Testament Prayer, you need to get it. It's a very important book that talks about Iteo and Lombano and the present tense and how we pray accurately to the Father in the name of Jesus in the New Testament. These are just more examples of all these things. Looking at the tense and the voice and the mood is going to be very important. Let me just share one example of this for you. Mark 11, 24. It says, Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe you receive them, and you shall have them. There has been a teaching throughout the country and the world that you only pray one time and you believe you receive that it's done. That if you pray more than one time, you must have been in doubt and unbelief the first time. Otherwise, why would you pray another time if you really truly believed you received? That is the teaching. And if you pray more than one time, you've been in error. That teaching is a false teaching. How do we know? This is the main, main scripture on the prayer of faith because we can look up the tense of the, of, ver of the verb. When I put the cursor of the word desire, by the way, it doesn't mean ask uh, or to, to desire like I wish to have something or I want to have something. It's the word iteo. Notice it, notice 154, which is the word to mean a demand of what's due you. It's talking about when you pray in New Testament prayer. Let's though, we're gonna look up, when I put the cursor over the word desire, I'm gonna show you the tense, voice, and mood. The tense is the present tense, which means continuous, repeated action. When I put the cursor over the word pray, we'll look at the tense on this. Present tense, participle. I put the word over believe. What is it? Present tense, imperative mood. How about on receive? Same thing. We put it over here. What do we find? Present tense. All four verbs 
are present tense, which means continuous, repeated action, ongoing action of the verb. Therefore, do we pray one time? No. We pray continuously and repeatedly until we see the result. So, this is a total false teaching, and it's pervade, perva been prevailing through the body of Christ, pervaded the whole thing, and everybody thinks that this is the way you're supposed to pray. Of course, they seem to ignore some of these scriptures, such as 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. Pretty clear. You know, you don't hear them quote those. They just kind of ignore those. This is where you've got to be really careful, watchful, that you don't just take what so-and-so says because they've got a few scriptures on it without looking up the words, for one, and also without looking at other words, other scriptures, such as this one. This is easily disproved. Yet the entire body of Christ out there, the majority, has really taken hold of this pray one time stuff from the Word of Faith type teaching, which I well know it because I went to a Word of Faith Bible school when I first went into the ministry. And I well know all their teachings and found out all the errors that were there when I began to study and solve the problems that were there. But this is another reason why We've got to study these things and look very clear. Also, some of the translations are just totally off. Let me show you one here, 1 Peter chapter 5. And this should whet your appetite for the fact that if you're going to study effectively, you've got to do word studies and look up all these words. Now you say, well, boy, I don't see how I can do that. You just get these things, or you get the e-sword, and you can start doing all these studies. You get this program. If you got $349, you want to get the best program in the world, this is it. You know, I understand it's pricey, but I'll tell you, if I'm going to buy anything, if I was a Christian today, this is what I would buy so that I could do studies on everything and anything and word studies. You're, you're going to be able to do every kind of study you want with just one thing and do it all. 1 Peter 5, 6, look what it says. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. I've had people say, you know, I don't understand why I'm not being exalted. You know, my due time certainly ought to come sometime, and I humbled myself under the hand of the Lord. So why haven't I been exalted? Because that's not what it's saying. Everybody says, well, the understood subject of that is you humble yourselves, right? That's what everybody thinks, right? Everybody's taught that. I've heard a message on that for years. Well, there's a problem. It's not you humble yourselves. It's a mistake in the translation. How do we know? We put the cursor over the word and we come down and look at it. We find that it happens to be aorist tense, passive voice, imperative mood. It is a command, but it happens to be aorist tense. Aorist tense is simple past tense. So it wouldn't be humble, it'd be humbled, for one. Secondly, the voice is passive voice. The passive voice is important. There are three voices in the Greek, and you need to learn these things. Don't be, sit there and think, well, this is overwhelming. This is just way over my head. If you don't learn these things, you'll never be able to rightly divide the word of truth. You can. It's not a lot, lot of things. Don't be overwhelmed and think you can't. There's an active voice, there's a middle voice, and there's a passive voice. The active voice, the subject, is doing the action. The middle voice, the subject, is doing the action for himself, for his own benefit. The passive voice, Somebody else is doing the action to the subject. He's not doing the action. It's passive voice, meaning he's being acted upon by someone or somebody else. That's what it is here, the passive voice. Therefore, he's, it's not humble yourself, you doing it for yourself. No, it is be humbled is the correct translation, being humbled by someone or something else. Be humbled passively. Somebody else is doing this to you. That's what the correct translation is because it's aorist, past tense, simple past tense, passive voice. That's why it'd be be humbled, not you humble yourself, but be humbled. Somebody else or something else is doing it. And it's imperative. It's a command. That's why Young's is so good. He corrected this and he's right on the mark with what it is. Now let's read it. Be humbled then under the the mighty is really talking about the powerful hand. Mighty is kratios, which means a manifested power. Under the powerful hand of God, that he may exalt you in good time. In other words, the powerful hand of God has to work in your life to come bring you to the place of being humbled 
And when you're humbled because of the powerful hand of God, His power working in your life, then He will be able to exalt you in due time. Now, how is the power of God in operation? Through you, through the Word in you, you hearing it and doing it. It's applied. It's working in your life. The power of God brings forth the fruit. And the power of God brings forth all the changes on the inside of you. And what does it do? It humbles you under the, under the mighty, powerful hand of God. Exactly. Plus, you've totally submitted to Him. You got out of the way. And he, He's done His work in you to change you, transform you, bring forth the fruit, bring forth the promise, and all that. Basically, it's the work of God being done in you. And then what happens? Then He can exalt you. So now you know, well, I wonder why I'm not been exalted because God hasn't been able to really do all the work he wants to do. Then he can exalt me in due time, see? But this is another prime example. You'd never get this in a million years by looking at any of the translations unless you looked it up or found a translation such as Young's. And plus, if you see it in the translation, you've got to verify that it's true. How do we know Young's is right? We've got to be sure he's right. We're going to look it up, and then we can find out the fact that he's right. So that, again, is another example showing how important this is. I'm going to show you one, a couple more before we close for this evening. I know this has been rather lengthy, but this is important for you to get a hold of. Proverbs 23, verse 7. In fact, this is one that I quoted for a long time until I looked it up one day and found out I was wrong all along. And then I would say to the congregation, you know, no, I'm humble. You know, I can say when I'm, I don't have a thing, oh, better hide this from myself. I think I'm not wrong, and maybe they'll think that something's wrong with me and I'm not a good teacher or whatever. No, I said, hey, this is wrong, what I've been saying, because it's wrong in the King James here. Proverbs 23, 7, for as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. People think, well, as I think in my heart, then that's the way I am. Well, it's not saying that, because the word heart is nefesh. The word for heart in the, in the Old Testament is elibi, leib. But this is nefesh, which means soul. It doesn't mean heart. So it's talking about as he thinketh in his soul, so is he. Not as you think in your heart. And I quoted this for years, you know. And then I found I was wrong. And I brought it to the congregation. You know, when I was in Columbus, said, hey, I got to show you, here's a correction. Forget about thinking in your heart. It's talking about thinking in your soul, because it's the key is getting the word in your mind so that you will think on the proper things. So is he. So not just as the word, everybody's thought as the word is in your heart, but it's also, there's other scriptures that talk about getting the word in your heart, but this one is actually talking about the word in your soul, which is talking about your mind to, and all, all to influence you and your choices and your attitudes and everything you do. So that again just shows there's an area where something was wrong and we got to find out what's the truth. Here's another one. And this is another one that I didn't know for a long time until I started studying it. Because everybody teaches this in the body of Christ regarding righteousness. Almost everybody teaches that once you're born again, you're perfectly righteous and you're the righteousness of God and you're righteous now because you've been made righteous, right? Everybody teaches that. Is that true? No. How do we know? Watch. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Sure looks like we've been made the righteousness of God in him, doesn't it? Well, let's unravel this first of all. Remember, we've got to look up all the words. First of all, we got the first word made. Notice what it is, 2160, 4160, excuse me, poieo, which means to make, translated made, or do uh, throughout. We even showed you this before, but we'll show it to you again, that it does mean to be made. It's translated do or make or made in the past tense. So that's correct. For he hath made, notice the number, 4160, him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made. Hey, we must see another 4160 there, right? Where's the 4160? It's not there, is it? It's now number 1096, Ginnemai. So the second word made is not made. It's a different Greek word. And what does it mean? It means to become. There's a big difference between being made or to become. If you're made, it's a done deal. If it's become, it means it's going to happen. If conditions are met, is what the implication is. That destroys the whole thing. It says I'm already the perfectly righteous. Right out the window, right there. And also, when we look up this word ginnemai, let's look up about the tense voice and mood so we can see well, what's going on here. It's present tense, which means continuously become, present tense, continuous action, 
and it happens to be subjunctive mood. Now, the subjunctive mood is important because it expresses things that are contrary to fact, that are conditional upon conditions being met. If it was a reality and a done deal, it would be the indicative mood, which is the mood of reality. It's not the mood of reality. It's the subjunctive. And this is very important, which means that it's conditional upon conditions being met. So what this is talking about, because it's in the present tense, it would be translated that we may become, if the, the conditions are met, the righteousness of God in him. And this is why Young's translates it, that we may become the righteousness of God in him. That changes the whole meaning, doesn't it? And that is what it really says. For him who did not know sin in our behalf, he did make sin, that we may become the righteousness of God in him. Because righteousness is more than just getting born again. It's more than getting born again. You get a righteous spirit, but it's more than that. How do we know? Well, we've got to look at the rest of the scriptures, because people that say we're perfectly righteous, which is most everybody out there teaches, you never hear them talk about this scripture. I've never heard them talk about this scripture ever. Yet, it's a pretty important scripture. 1 John 3, 7, which says, Little children, let no man deceive you. Whenever you see something that says, don't let anybody deceive you, you know, hey, the, there must be a warning here because everybody must be being deceived about this subject. Otherwise, why would we be warned, let no man deceive you? Obviously, there must be something going on here. Let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. Is righteous just being born again and I'm perfectly righteous? No. That's part of it. You can't be righteous unless you're born again because you have to have the spirit that's right with him. But it's more than that. It's also doing righteousness. And what is the tense of the verb there? Present tense. Continuous repeated action. That's why Young's hits it right on the mark when he says, he who is doing the righteousness is righteous. Therefore, who is righteous? The one who's born again and is doing righteousness, which is the word of righteousness, that's the guy that's righteous. That changes the whole concept of righteousness. And 99.9% .9 of all the teaching out there on righteousness is error. Therefore, we have major problems in the body of Christ. Everybody thinks, I'm perfectly righteous, everything's fine. And they just do whatever they want. And they got all kind of unrighteousness in them from sin. But I'm still perfectly righteous because I'm righteous in spirit. Sorry, that's not what it is. <clears throat> Right. So we have a problem here. And the problem is that people have not studied. Well, we've got to get ourselves straight on all these things. And we could spend a lot more time on things. Uh, there's just so much. Uh, we could go forever. But I'll just, I just want to say one more thing. And we talked about this last week. Remember about the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. And we talked about the fact that the baptism of the Holy Spirit. What's the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Everybody out there in full gospel, Pentecostal, charismatic, world says it's an experience after we're born again. Well, when you look at the scriptures and you got this one that says 1 Corinthians 12, 13, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, that's when we come into the new, that's the new birth, coming into the body of Christ. Therefore, we see a scripture now. What have all the full gospel, Pentecostal, charismatic, word of faith people done with this scripture? They've ignored it. If, that, if they believe that, they'd say, well, guess what? The baptism of the Holy Spirit is when we came into the body of Christ. And they'd realize, well, guess what? It can't, we can't be calling this the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We must be off somewhere. But instead, they've either not looked at this verse or they've ignored it, one or the other. This is a classic example of you can't just ignore a scripture and then make a doctrine out of something. You've got to look at all of the verses. And of course, we talked about the baptism of the Holy Spirit's new birth, the receiving of the Holy Spirit's when he comes to dwell in you, and the filling of the Holy Spirit's continuous repeated action for service. And it's a very important message. <coughs> so, we got major problems, and we could sit here and talk to you all night about all the things. But the point that you want to see is this. We've got to learn to study. And how are you going to be able to study best? Do word studies on specific words according to, preferably, the Hebrew and or the Greek word. Look at all the scriptures on that. Look up everything. Check out the tense voice and mood. Find out what it says. 
and look at all the scriptures on that subject. They're all truth. And then look at everything that it's saying, and it's going to start putting the whole pieces together on the whole truth about that subject. That's the way you're going to also, you go, there's other things that course can help you. Bible uh, uh, books that are such as uh, dictionaries, Bible dictionaries can help you. There's lots of good resources out there. But I find that if you just rely on Bible dictionaries or you rely on uh, people with their little notes or you rely on commentaries, I don't use them at all because that's man's stuff that brings it in and it's kind of coloring you in certain directions what they think. And the only time I look at those is if someone else says, well, the commentary says such as such, so I check it out to find out what they're saying. But also, the key is look at the scriptures because then you're, only, you're open to revelation and you see the scriptures say this, that's the truth. Now, suppose this goes contrary to your teaching. Like, for instance, maybe I just brought up this thing about righteousness. And you believed all your Christian life because you've heard it from everybody out there that I'm perfectly righteous because I'm born again. Well, now, you've just been presented with a scripture, 2 Corinthians 5, 21 and 1 John 3, 7, that destroyed that belief. Now you're going to have to do something with that, which means what would be your proper response? Well, that's a truth, and that's a truth, and I'm going to study all the scriptures on righteousness, and I'm going to get the whole picture about what righteousness is all about. I'm not going to ignore those scriptures and just hold on to my nice little doctrine over here because everybody says we're perfectly righteous, and I just want to believe I'm righteous. No. Since these scriptures have been presented, now I've got to realize, I guess the doctrine cannot be right, obviously, because it says well, we may become if we meet the conditions. Therefore, that's just an example. We've got to ha always have our repentance shoes on, ready to change, and be ready to examine, lay everything on the ta table that we believe in the face of the Word of God to find out if it's true or not. If we won't, then we become unteachable, or we have rejected the knowledge of God, or we're going to look at everything through our rose-colored glasses the way I've always seen them, and that's the way I'm going to believe. Or we're going to say, well, we believe in such and such. And that's what you see in all these churches, pastors, ministries, and we got a big mess today. Instead of them being willing to look at all these things, that's what changed me 28 years ago. At the very beginning, when I saw the, about the Holy Spirit and I realized this is a mess out there and I, I can't teach something that's contrary. And I'd heard everybody talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and all those things. And then when I started studying the scriptures and I saw the fact that it was the born again experience and the filling was continuous repeated, it was in the Old Testament, and I thought that couldn't have anything to do with the Holy Spirit coming in since it happened in the Old Testament. So I, you know, I just, when I started seeing it, I just threw out everything that I ever knew. And I've learned to do that on everything. Not that I'm discarding things for the purpose of just ignoring them. I'm discarding them for the purpose that I'm in ready for revelation. This scripture's true, that's true. It's all going to fit together. It's going to bring the revelation. That's how I came to the place of understanding the difference between the baptism, receiving, filling of the Holy Spirit. That's also how I came to the place of understanding about Iteo and Lombano and how you pray consistently. And all the same thing about righteousness, same thing about these other things. Now, have I arrived? No. I got a long way to go. I got tons of things to study. I'm studying all the time. But praise God, I know one thing. I'm on course because I'm approaching it the way God would have us to approach it, which is to study every single scripture and everyone's true and, and thank the Holy Spirit for bringing revelation and allowing the Holy Spirit to bring the truth, not being colored by previous beliefs or doctrinal stands or where my background has come from. So this is what I found to do. And I highly recommend that you learn to study in this way. As you do it, you're going to see great changes. Always have your repentance shoes on. And I've already told people in this congregation, of course, anywhere I go, the fact that this is what you have. Of course, we've seen some people that you don't see here anymore because they didn't have their repentance shoes on. and something they didn't like. And so, well, I believe such and such, and so you don't see them come any longer. Instead of being open and teachable, or at least coming and saying, uh, what about this? Can you expound on this? Or at least uh, I've not believed this and I don't understand that and I'd like to have a little further clarification and can you prove this to me? But we haven't seen people. I've even seen people that were here that you don't see anymore because they, they have just vanished with no word, no contact whatsoever. That shows the wrong attitude. Don't let yourself be unteachable. Don't let yourself be one who's stuck in the mud in what I believe and then not be open or ask questions or approach things, you are making a great mistake. I learned that myself. 
And I've learned I've got to stay open and teachable myself. And I always stay that way. And praise God, I'm ready to change and repent on anything that comes that is the wrong thing because I want to know the truth. I don't need some pride thing, attitude, well, we have our way and we believe our way and think that I've arrived or I'm something. You know, that's the problem with most all the, all the churches and ministers and denominations and stuff. They'd have to repudiate a whole lot of their teaching and have to stand up before everybody and say, hey, we were wrong on all this stuff. Oh, that's not going to go over too good. They're going to probably, you know, kicked out of the denomination because we don't want to play that. We've been believing this for 100 years or so or 200 years or 500 years or whatever, and now you're telling me it's all wrong? You know, hey, be right with God. That's all that counts. And we've got to get the truth. And the truth is the key. And that is what is important. That's what I've learned to do. That's what I encourage you to do. I trust this has been helpful for you to show you what to do to study and what it takes. Don't be overwhelmed. You're going to learn this stuff. If you can get this program, it's the best thing. You're on your way to being taught tremendously in the Word of God. Say this to me. Heavenly Father, thank you for all that you brought forth, bringing the revelation of how to study, to get the true knowledge of God, so that I will not be deceived, but that I will rightly divide the Word of Truth. I thank you that I have a desire to know the truth, so I'm going to seek after the truth. I trust the Holy Spirit to lead me and guide me into all the truth. I thank you, Father, for giving me a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you, opening the eyes of my understanding. Thank you for bringing revelation knowledge. I will study the word accurately looking up the words, knowing every scripture is true. And I thank you that you're going to teach me all these truths, and they'll all fit together to see the total picture of the truth of the Word of God on subject after subject. Thank you for bringing forth the truth as I study according to your Word. In Jesus' name.